Well, hello there, my friends, and good afternoon, and thank you for joining us here today at Arcadia Economics. Hope everybody is doing well out there. And as you may have seen earlier today, we did have some news out this morning from Fortuna Silver as they released their fourth quarter production numbers. Also had guidance for 2024, and certainly a lot to dig into because there has been a lot going on in these past couple of years at the company and some new acquisitions, some of which are underway, some of which are getting closer to that point. And fortunately, to join me and dig through all of it is Jorge Ginoza, the CEO of Fortuna Silver. So Jorge, welcome on in. It's a pleasure to have you here as always. And how are you doing today, my friend? Hello, uh, Chris. And once again, thank you for the opportunity to speak to your audience. Well, I appreciate you being here and perhaps to dig in, as I mentioned, you did have the production numbers out, which was a record 2023 for the company. Obviously, a lot of that driven by the things that have been going on at Seguela, where got into production late in the second quarter and now have had a whole half of a year of production there. And perhaps you could walk us through the We'll start first with the production from 2023, and then we'll dig into guidance and a whole host of other things from there. Yes, <clears throat> we had a strong close for the year, uh, or or we produced uh, 107,000 ounces of, of gold uh, in the fourth quarter, which is a 13% increase compared to the previous quarter. Uh, our silver production was down. Uh, now, Silver accounts roughly for uh, slightly below 20% of sales today. Uh, and uh, gold accounts for roughly 75, 80% of sales, right? So our, our silver production had a, a, a decline quarter to quarter. And uh, our gold production, which is a bulk of our sales today, was uh, significantly up 13%. So our gold equivalent uh, production uh, was a record, uh, 136,000 ounces of gold. Uh, and, and when we think of our production in terms of a gold equivalent, uh, we were 6% higher when we compare ourselves to the third quarter of, of this year. No, So quarter on quarter, uh, we continue to exhibit uh, overall growth. Uh, and, and as I said, a strong close for, for 2023. All right. And then we'll dig into a few of those things more, but obviously did want to touch on the guidance going forward for 2024. A few things that are now in the equation, but perhaps you could walk us through the guidance and any thoughts you have there. Yes. <clears throat> for 2024, we're guiding in production, gold equivalent production in the range of 460 to half a million ounces of gold. Uh, so that compares to our, our gold production for 2023, which was 450,000 ounces, 452,000 ounces of gold equivalents. So uh, for, for 2024, you know, we, we are exhibiting growth. Uh, on the top end of guidance, it can be as much as 10% uh, growth. No, we're aching to to get uh, close to the half a million ounces of gold uh, gold equivalents uh, in terms of annual production. Now, when we break the gold equivalent uh, for gold, gold production, uh, again continues to to be the the bulk of of uh, represent the bulk of the gold equivalent production. Or, or if we think of sales, gold will account for you know, 80, 85% of sales. Uh, our silver production is declining. Silver production, uh, we're guiding for 2024 between four and, and, and 4.7 million ounces, uh, which is a projected decrease of uh, around you know, 25, 30%. Uh, this is because our San Jose mine in Mexico which is the, our largest silver contributor uh, in the portfolio, uh, is coming to its last year of operations, right? So uh, we continue exploring. We continue uh, pursuing opportunities there. 
but if we uh, look at our, our reserve inventory today, we can support mining operations uh, throughout 2024 one more year. Yeah. Yeah, and certainly that's something we're going to touch on. Obviously, you've had some exploration success with the Yesi vein, and we'll dig into how that path might cross over. Although something we've talked a little bit about before, without looking too far down the road, you're getting close to that half half a million ounce production mark. Based on now what you've seen from Seguela, having a couple of quarters where it's up and running, do you have an idea of what is the longer term target in terms of an annual production range in the in the years beyond 2024? Yeah, I mean, we want to position ourselves as a you know mid-sized producer with a solid uh, uh, gold equivalent production in in the range of uh, half a million ounces annually. So you know. Uh, as I said, in 2023, we we delivered 450,000 ounces. In 2024, we're getting closer to the half a million ounces. And uh, for 2025, 2026, <clears throat> you know, we have a, a diversified portfolio. Uh, we have mines with long life of reserves. We have others that are running short on reserves. And we have new projects and opportunities. So... Like with any, you know, large portfolio of assets, uh, we have, uh, you know, some challenges, but of, of, of also some exciting opportunities. So, you know, although we see uh, San Jose coming to the tail end of its reserves, uh, today we continue exploring. As you well mentioned, we have an exciting discovery there, which is a yes event where we're putting the money throughout 2024 with the expectation that we can uh, uh, develop resources that can help support, you know, an ongoing operation beyond 2024. Uh, we have the Diamba Sud project acquisition in Senegal. Uh, you know, our largest exploration budget in our $38 million uh, portfolio of exploration today uh, is Diamba Sud. So we are prioritizing those high value opportunities to continue uh, supporting our, our life of mine. At currently at uh, the Embassy, we have about 850,000 ounces of gold in, in, in resources. And, uh, you know, we've been drilling since uh, October uh, with two, three rigs on the property, working one is to upgrade the existing inventory and bring additional ounces. We want to be in a position in 2024 to uh, define a plus million ounce uh, resource that can support you know, a construction decision. That project has already seen a lot of engineering. So to move it to uh, a feasibility, pre-feasibility stage and construction decision should not take long. But we want to take those resources beyond a million ounces of, of gold uh, before we, we, we make that. And I believe we have a fair chance to do that in 2024. And with that, continue supporting our life of mine plans at half a million ounces a year or close to that. The same thing happens with Seguela. We have exciting news in the guidance at Seguela. Seguela, uh, in the original uh, feasibility study technical report, uh, developed in 2021, uh, you know, was designed to produce an, an initial rate of 1,250,000 tons, tonnes of throughput right. for the first three years of operation. And in year three, we had an investment, which at the time was estimated at around 30 to $50 million to upgrade the processing facility to uh, 1.5 million tons annually of, of throughput capacity. Well, we're coming out of the first six months of production in 2023, and we're already telling the market that we are running that mill at, uh, we're gonna be running that mill in 2024 at 1.46 million tons of annual production. So 
without any further investment, we're capturing you know, almost 70% of the expansion that we planned for 2020, for, for year three, you know, that would be sometime in 2026. So we're capturing that expansion today without any significant additional capital. You know? So uh, that's a big uh, positive and also supportive of, you know, a, or, or half a million ounce target. So yes, the San Jose mine uh, is running short on reserves, but we have exploration opportunities. We continue pursuing those. We have significant budgets allocated to that. And in the portfolio, we also have high value opportunities like the Ambassad, uh, moving on through to a production construction decision and a, a further expansion at uh, Seguela. So, you know, it's a varied portfolio we have. Uh, uh, we have uh, five mines uh, and a project and a developing project. So, you know, we have levers to pull and, and, and that's what we're doing. And I believe you still have the ability to increase the size of the processing facility at Seguela. Is that correct? Yes, as I just explained, we are already, we're running the mill at 20% higher throughput in 2024 than what the original technical report and, 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 uh, and uh, construction plans uh, we had. So we've been able to capture all the opportunities we have to do that. So, and beyond that, can we expand it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we have the, the real estate at the plant and and, uh, and 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 the conceptual designs to, if needed, go, you know, beyond 1.5 million tons. We're currently doing 1.4, 1.46. That's what okay. we're targeting for 2024. Uh, we could go beyond that, adding a, a, another gold mill as a regrind or, or, I mean, we still need to look at the details of that. But the point is we're capturing those opportunities in the portfolio. Mm -hmm. Okay. And to put it in context for people in terms of what will be the key things to look at in terms of the production, would it still be safe to say that Seguela is at the top of the list and perhaps rank that in terms of some of the other mines and sites you have in terms just of what's really going to be driving things in a bit of an order? You know, Seguela is a pillar in our in our mine portfolio, absolutely. So watch for that. And uh, Seguela, by no means, is uh, at a steady state yet. Uh, you know, in the first six months of production, I reiterate, we have been able to capture significant opportunities. First, we're getting good positive reconciliation from what we estimate in reserves to what we actually mine. You know, we're getting more gold out of the right. ground than our original estimates. Second, we're able to run more ore through the mill. You know, after six months of operations, I am telling you that we are gonna, we're hiking above nameplate capacity almost 20%, 17, 20% 17, 20% for 2024, and we still have opportunities. We have not really done any serious debottlenecking yet. So lots of opportunity. And third is the exploration potential, you know? One of the, the things that uh, really uh, uh, captured our, our interest when we uh, looked at the opportunity to acquire rocks in 2020, back in 2021, uh, Chris was the exploration potential at Seguela. We have a commanding land position over 30 kilometers along the strike on one of the most prolific coal belts in West Africa. Um, we have uh, multiple projects and uh, that we're pursuing. We have a significant exploration budget allocated. We're currently doing trade-offs already in 20, early 2024 uh, for underground mining. Uh, our Seguela mine plans do not contemplate any underground mining yet. So everything is constrained within a pit. But right now we're moving to optimize uh, when should we transition from open pit to, to underground, hopefully to capture some uh, cost benefits uh, by reducing stripping, no? stripping costs. 
and and also you know increasing resources i am confident that the life of mine will easily be pushed beyond 10 years we're currently at eight nine years will be easily pushed beyond 10 and more importantly than that, we have a good argument uh, and a case, strong case, to to upsize the production uh, over the next, you know, 12, 24 months, right? Based on exploration success. So all of those are, are big positives. So Seguela is an opportunity for expansion and growth. The Ambassad is another important opportunity for expansion and, and, and growth, the ambassador in Senegal. Uh, so, you know, at, at uh, San Jose, the Yesi vein provides some uh, uh, excitement and, 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 and hope that we can uh, continue operating the San Jose mine uh, beyond 2024. San Jose for many years. San Jose was brought into operations back in 2011. And uh, it quickly became one of the top uh, 12 uh, largest primary silver producers in the world, right? It's an important mine. And, uh, you know, we are putting the money on the exploration and we have some good ideas still to pursue. Yeah, and certainly that was something I wanted to dig into a little more because, as you mentioned in the press release, the exhaustion of mineral reserves was initially scheduled for mid-2025. You've had to push that forward to mid-2024. And if you could talk about that process, the different things that you're looking at, obviously there is the SE vein. Is there the possibility that that bridge can be gapped or are we looking at putting the mine in care and maintenance and anything you can touch on just into what you've seen and the decision-making there going forward? Yes. Uh... Based on our, our updating for the 2024 budget, based on the updating of costs and, and, and macroeconomics uh, estimates for that mine, <clears throat> we have seen a, a significant cost increase, right? Uh, about, uh, it's a 30% cost increment, and about a third of that, a little over a third of that 30% cost increment is driven by uh, Mexican peso appreciation. I believe the appreciation of the local currency is something that has hit all operators in Mexico, and we have not been immune to that. Um, the other one is uh, cost inflation driven by uh, services, contractors, uh, the labor loss, uh, have also changed in in Mexico, uh, driving an increase in uh, in the cost of of uh, the workforce. So uh, all of those things have uh, piled into a, what is a thirty percent cost increment for us. So uh, when we update reserves, uh, you know that cost increment has taken a toll. On, on on reserves that would have that means uh, about a six month shortened mine life. So we're right now we were looking at at a year and a half in the original plan. Now we're looking only at, at a year. Uh, so <clears throat> we're you know update uh, reviewing options for the mine, uh, updating or accordingly updating or. Uh, mine closure plan uh, and and uh, continued aggressively with exploration. As I always say, you know, the uh, the geologists should be the first ones to arrive and the last ones to leave. We're going to be drilling uh, there, and, and uh, we have good targets that we will continue to pursue. Yeah, yeah, and you mentioned before the Yesi vein where you had that intersect at twelve hundred ninety nine grams. 1,299 grams per ton silver equivalent last year. Can you give people an idea of anything that you've learned in that time since then and perhaps any insight you have to a timeline of when you could have further definition on what you have there and how that could impact what decisions you make 
going forward at San Jose. Yes, the, the Jesse vein has been a, a very exciting high-grade discovery in our property. It's relatively close to infrastructure. And uh, now what we need to see is the transition of Jesse from an exciting discovery into uh, a resource that we can, uh, you know, that ha can have a meaningful impact in our mine plants, right? And that's where we are. Uh, so, so for 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 your audience, if they're not experienced with mining, uh, an exciting discovery is one thing, and uh, we need to see that exciting discovery migrating yeah. into a, an exciting discovery migrating into an exciting resource, right? So uh, and that's important. And that's where we are. We're currently drilling, uh, you know, and and we are looking forward to update the market as soon as we have. A better understanding. Yes, it is a bit of a different animal. It, it strikes in a different uh, way, which is not a bad thing. To the contrary, we believe uh, it uh, it's opening our eyes to a new structural uh, dilational setting uh, that is uh, favorable for for you know broad zones of mineralization and ha traditionally high grades at uh, at uh, San Jose. But certainly strikes uh, differently. It's more a north, uh, northwest, uh, north, thirty degrees west strike. Uh, traditionally, the main system at San Jose is more north south, right? Okay. Well, certainly we'll be looking forward to seeing how things progress there. Obviously, given where you're at, that would be a big win for the company and. In terms of one of the other mines at Yaramoko, I know you guys mentioned the exploration and grade control drilling success, extended the mineralization on the western side of zone 55. You've also gone from 7.16 grams per ton last year, guidance calling for 8.3 grams per ton in 2024. Is, is there a number that you think that you'll be settling in and anything else that you can share on the exploration progress there? You know, we were just talking about uh, San Jose and, and where we are at with with uh, with the life of reserves and, and plants we have. But uh, if we think of Yaramoco, Yaramoco was a couple of years ago set for closure in 2023, late 2023. And right now, uh, we not only had a, a superb 2023, but we're looking also to a most exciting 2024, right? So, uh, you know, that's been achieved on the back of exploration success. Uh, you know, we have continued pushing the boundaries of mineralization on the main zone 55, which today is almost a kilometer deep. So we're mining uh, uh, deep down there and uh, pushing mineralization on the western boundary, on the eastern boundary of the structure. And we've been enjoying success. And uh, most excitingly, high-grade ounces is what we've been able to add to the inventory. That is what led to, to those higher grades you mentioned, right? So 2024 is looking very strong. 2023, you know, uh, very strong as well. So, yeah, we're excited. And, and uh, again, a mine that was set for closure in 2023 is looking at a strong 2024 and a very viable 2025, right? Yeah, and certainly speaks to the success that you've had in West Africa and getting involved in that region, which I know people were questioning back a couple of years ago. And certainly it's nice to be able to fast forward and see how you have implemented the things going on there. And... In terms of stepping over for a moment to Lindero, I had a question from our dear friend, Dave Kranzler, who was not able to join us today, but was looking at the strip ratio at Lindero, which was at 1.14 to one, which has changed a bit. And is there a normalized strip ratio going forward? And also how Lindero is being the all and sustaining cost there is being a, a impacted by the leach pad expansion. Yes. Uh, before I answer the details on on Lindero, let me take a, a, a broader look and then zoom in to Lindero. Sure. And 
broader look, it's from the perspective of cost, right? Uh, we're guiding, <clears throat> we're guiding to uh, uh, consolidated uh, cash cost of almost a thousand dollars per ounce cash cost. Uh, in 2024, uh, uh, and uh, or ASIC, you no, know, all in sus or all in sustaining cost uh, is guided at around you know in the range of 1500 dollars $1, per per ounce. What is driving the 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 ASIC? You no, know? because I I believe our cash cost is competitive, very competitive at uh, around uh, or slightly below a thousand dollars per ounce no i believe that's a competitive cash cost uh, now our asic is higher what's driving the higher asic you know lindero is one of those explanations lindero currently uh, has a large capital project and uh, significant stripping to be done in 2023 sorry 2024 so or or uh, the strip ratio, this is a one pit. So for strip ratio for the life of mind, like uh, Dave is asking, the normalized strip ratio is in the range of 1.1, 1.5, 1 1.15, no? Now that figure will oscillate, right? That figure will oscillate in the fourth quarter, uh, or strip ratio has been very low, 0 0.4, right? Uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Uh, so we did more stripping in the first half of the year and then stripping decreased in the second half of the year. That's what we've seen, right? Or stripping at the beginning of the year was, you know, over 1.5, right? So, uh, but if you want to normalize here, uh, like the life of mine strip ratio, it's around close to 1.2. No, okay. close to 1.2, which is, I believe, a very competitive strip ratio. Uh, but what uh, burdens the ASIC at this mine and impacts or uh, overall ASIC, Chris, is that this year we're executing a major project at uh, Lindero, which is the leach pad expansion. Uh, we're into year three, no, 20, 2021, 2020, actually year four of operations here. And uh, uh, we need to expand the leach, but this is a one-time expansion of the leach pad. It was already in our in our plans, yeah. and uh, it's a major project. This year, we're going to spend close to forty-one million dollars uh, in the leach pad expansion. Uh, so that is one of the main explanations for the higher ASIC at this mine and the impact it has on our overall ASIC as well. Okay, and speaking of forty-one million dollars, uh, something I think people were happy to see that I believe was just last week, second quarter in a row, you guys have been paying down debt. Last quarter it was forty million, and not not a coincidence. Obviously, this is coming at the time when Seguela now in production, which led to a very strong third quarter. We'll find out in a couple of weeks how things came out with the financials in the fourth quarter, but two quarters in a row now where 40 million and then 41 million, which has brought your your leverage ratio down quite a bit lower and certainly would love to hear your thoughts on that. And is that something that's going to be ongoing and uh, any any other, any, anything else you can share around that news? No, I think that is consistent. Uh, These uh, debt payments are consistent with our messaging. We have uh, say, been saying that uh, our priority is uh, giving maximum flexibility to our balance sheet and uh, through debt repayment. So in the third quarter, we paid $41 million, $40 million. In the fourth quarter, we're paying, like you pointed out here, another 41. And our expectation is that throughout 2024, uh, we can advance another close to $100 million in payments. Right, yeah. and uh, all of that from uh, the strong cash flow generation that our business is providing at these prices, right? So, you know, no, no, no change there. 
uh, our message is consistent and, and follow with our actions. So uh, no surprises here, I, I expect. And, and I think speaks to the strength of the business. Uh, you know, again, we had a strong 2023 uh, and we're looking for a very strong 2024. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, and certainly a nice time to have record production at the same period where we're having the, I think it was the highest average gold price in the fourth quarter. And another thing that when we were talking about with Dave this morning, he was pointing out, even if he suggested if we had a $2,100 average gold price in 2024, even at that $1,500 cost of getting the gold out of the ground, still looking at a 40% margin, which is certainly a nice position to be in. Yeah, but we, we have to be careful because when we talk about uh, you know the fifteen hundred dollars again, we're talking about ASIC, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, in in this case, I, you know, I subscribe to the use of ASIC. Don't get me wrong, but uh, or or cost or true measure of cost or cash cost to get the gold out of the ground is a thousand dollars slightly sub a thousand dollars which i say as i said before i think it's quite competitive now in 2024 we'll we're funding a series of capital projects and mines require capital projects all the time right are are very demanding on capital but in this case we have one major project which is 41 million dollars you know which it's impacting and weighing heavy on our ASIC. Uh, but this this is a, a project we're funding in 2024 that is good for you know the next right. years to come. So uh, it is a, a, a large capital project. You know, we could try to schedule it differently and do it in, in segments throughout three years, but we believe that would lead to higher costs there will be inefficiencies in the construction process if we try to schedule it like that. So we believe it's most efficient to try to do the project in, at once. And, and, you know, that takes a toll. That takes a toll because we publish a higher ASIC and everybody says, oh, my God, no, ASIC is going higher. I understand that there, this is a, 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 a leach bed expansion that will serve the mine for the next decade. And we're doing yeah. it in one year, and uh, because of the stacking sequence and because you know uh, other technical aspects, uh, it's not something we can do, you know, staged over ten years. The most we could do is try to do it over two, perhaps over three years, and that would be bring technical challenges and higher costs to operate. So, you know. What do we do? Do we play the market trying to show a low ASIC this year and then make life difficult and more expensive in the coming years? Or we do some serious work here and do it technically like it should be done because we can fund it. Right? Yeah. So we're doing what's technically sensible here. And, you know, if our ASIC has to uh, show up a bit higher than we would like because of this one project, well, we'll take it on the chin. But that's that's a long-term a sound business decision uh, rather than trying to schedule things in a different way, making things more complicated for the operation. You know, you know, Chris, mines are complex animals and yes. you don't want to make life more complex than it already is, right? Yeah. So uh, we rather do this and create the surface area for the stacking sequence to move uh, with flexibility, uh, and, and, and help, for example, a faster recovery because we're closer to, to the first level levels. No, we don't have to stack higher. Uh, we have lots of room to stack and play. So, you know, those are the flexibilities we want to give our operation. And, uh, and, you know, so I think it's we're, we're, it's a sound decision and, and we're happy with it. But it's a it's a it's a big project, right? It's Forty one million dollar one time project that we're funding in one year. 
Well, and I think that speaks to one of the things that people really like about Fortuna, where obviously if you put costs up front and it leads to a number that has a bigger expense in the short term, sometimes the market is quite reactive to that. But being willing to do that when it's the best long-term decision is, I think, at least for people who are long-term investors and are looking for companies that are managed well, I think yeah, it's an important I, thing. I look at the short performance today and, yeah, but I look at the short performance today. I am an investor in Fortune, you know? Yeah. I am a long-term investor in Fortune. And in fact, as I've been, you know, telling you in the past, I'm a long-term investor in precious metals. My family has been in mining. I'm the fourth generation. So we've been invested. Where if there if there is someone who played the, the sector long is 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 me, and I am long Fortuna. So, uh, but what I see is the market dominated by traders and speculators, and you know it is what it is. You know it's fine, uh, but uh, I don't let that noise uh, be disturbing to me. Uh, you know the company is stronger than ever. We have a balanced mixed portfolio yes assets with you know long promising life of mines exploration potential another was other ones with challenges in the short term but still with opportunities as well right so we we have to manage that mining is not a simple business you know uh, if you want simple business perhaps you should buy i don't know coca-cola uh, uh, but uh the coke company or pepsi or something like that. but you know mining we work in tough jurisdictions uh uh, we, we have no pricing power, you know, or what we sell is a commodity, behaves like a commodity. We have no pricing power. Uh, you know, we've been subject to significant inflation throughout and again, without purchasing power. If I look at, I remember 2011 when prices peaked yeah. and we were operating with three times margin over cost, over AC, three times margin. Today we're operating with what? 30%, 25% margin. You know, it's a different business. And, you know, uh, we have to th be able to thrive in, in whatever market, but gold is at nominal highs, uh, but inflation over the last decade has eaten all the margin, right? So that's something to consider. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you've also mentioned how your long gold and silver every day have been long and gold and silver since before you were born a couple generations back and maybe one day we could make a therapy helpline for people who are getting overly anxious about the day-to-day -day, which uh, you know i i think the, the 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 mining equity investor needs thick skin uh, and and uh yeah no absolutely uh uh, it's a tough environment, particularly today for, for, for the investor. And, uh, you know, the market, I believe, is being uh, governed by uh, speculators and, 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 and traders more than investors today. Uh, that's a departure from what we've seen in, you know, I would say a decade ago, right? Yeah. By now, a decade ago. Uh, but it is what it is. And, and uh, you know, I don't by, by no means complain about what it, the market is doing or not doing. Or, este, you know, we reported uh, record production. This is a business that's driven by physical, no? Physicals drive this business. So uh, what was our physical delivery of gold? Record gold production in 2023. What is our physical delivery Guidance for 2024, record gold production again, no gold equivalent production. Uh, in spite of our costs going uh, higher, uh, they're going marginally higher, marginally, and uh, in line with the entire industry. You know, if, we, if you look at, you know, Barrick, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and many other producers, they're already coming up guiding for cost increases, cost pressures. Uh, so uh, I don't believe, you know, we were always working to contain costs, but I don't believe we're alone there in our struggle to, to balance cost. So, uh, you know, I, I see the company in a strong position and, and uh, with a lot of uh, expectations and, and opportunities for the future.
Yeah, certainly, like you mentioned, we've been seeing this with a lot of the mining shares in the past couple of weeks where any news that deviates, they're, they're getting beaten up a little bit. And one note I'd like to mention to our audience watching, if you did have questions, feel free to type those in. We have a little time left. And even if you typed in a question earlier, perhaps you could repaste it again. We'll get to as many of those as we can. Although one question that already came in, which I think you and I have talked about this. I don't know if we discussed it on the show. Someone was asking if you do hedge any of your production, if that's something you might do going forward and for people who are wondering about that perhaps you could share your thoughts on how you look at that process yes you know when we do hedging it uh, it's a response to to a, a budget a tactical decision more than strategic is tactical right so in principle we don't hedge no we want our investors uh, to be exposed to the upside and and and, and uh, of the metal, you know, that we want that leverage. If we hedge, we're capping that leverage, right? Having said that, uh, we might go into enter into tactical hedges. For example, with the San Jose mine having a, you know a one year in the current life of mine, that can change it throughout the year if we have some exploration success. But with the current life of mine, uh, no uh, plan, which is one year we might want to enter into a tactical hedge, right? Lindero having a large capital project in 2024, you know, we are considering perhaps they're a tactical hedge, right? Yeah. To protect the budget in a particular year, in a particular case scenario, right? So, uh, but outside of that, no, no. We want our investor to, to have the benefit of, uh, 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 or, or stock providing leverage to moves in, in the precious metals. Yes, yeah, so people owning Fortuna shares still get to be very long gold and silver, which I think is what a lot of us really enjoy about that. Another question that just came in, actually something I'd wanted to ask you and touched on something you mentioned in the press release this morning. Obviously with Lindendero in Argentina, we have some new leadership there under Javier Malay, who I might add had quite a speech at Davos recently. So uh, curious if uh, you have any thoughts on him in particular, or perhaps more relevant, how that impacts your planning and any decisions that you have to make. I know a lot is still unknown, but anything you could share there, I know people are interested in. To, to begin, I think we are all quite excited in the business sector uh, with the arrival of uh, Mr. Millet. No? I believe he has all the right ideas. Uh, the path he needs to follow is not simple, it's not easy. Uh, he, he doesn't have majority in Congress. He needs to pass a lot of the laws that will reform the, the country for the long term, right? So, uh, but again, today I think we all look at him with a lot of expectation, right? Now, short term, everybody in Argentina is feeling some pain, everybody, because the first thing Argentina needs to do is close its fiscal deficit, right? Which currently runs around 5%. So uh, it needs to close the fiscal deficit and uh, show the international lenders that uh, Argentina is no more this chronic defaulter, right? Uh, and I think the, the, the international lenders, the IMF, the bondholders, the private bondholders, are going to be willing to work with Mr. Millet if he shows that, you know, he closes his fiscal deficit and he starts promoting uh, investment back again in the country. So, you know, I think it's going to be a tough 2024 in Argentina as, you know, the, everybody will have to tighten their belts in this national crusade I would turn it like that, a national crusade to close the fiscal deficit. 
And once that is achieved, hopefully we can uh, start seeing light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, and uh, uh, you know, Argentina back again being uh, this uh, most exciting jurisdiction for for mining and, and other industries, right? Uh, the wealth uh, in Argentina is tremendous, but uh, decades of populist governments have uh, created an unsustainable, uh, you know, uh, macroeconomic uh, environment that Mr. Millet is trying to solve. Yeah, cert certainly I, somewhat ironic that he happens to be in Argentina, where, as you mentioned, they've struggled with currency issues and governmental issues for such a long time. And will be something that I'm sure people will be keeping an eye on. So appreciate you sharing that. And we have another question from Derek here. I uh, was wondering anything uh, in terms of share buybacks that you're planning, whether this quarter or anything that you can share publicly in terms of the thought process there? Yes. You know, we talked about our priority with debt uh, reduction. That's priority number one. But we will also weigh that against share buybacks, right? Uh, we have our own assessment of uh, NAV for Fortuna. And I have to say that at times like this, we look at the share price, particularly when we see what we reckon are irra irrational market reactions. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, uh, participating in the market through share buybacks is a strong proposition, absolutely. Okay, and one other thing I noticed you mentioned in there, you did have record lead and zinc production. Perhaps you could talk about that, how much of an impact that actually has and whether you're expecting those levels going forward. Yes, uh, you know, base metals come only from one of the mines in the portfolio, that is the Cayoma mine in, in Peru. And uh, base metals, Today account for about five percent of revenue, right? So in the bigger scheme of things, are not a significant contributor, but at the mine level, at the asset level, they are. They are important for the the Cayoma mine. So uh, you know that that mine just continues giving. You no, know? it's, it's it's the smallest mine in our portfolio today. It was our our first mine. No. Uh, you know, but if I have to think of Kayoma uh, in simple terms, I will say that there is no easy mind. There is no headache-free mind. But if there is one that gets close to that, gets close to that, is the Kayoma mind. The yeah. team that does an excellent job, consistent delivery, uh, you know, always beating uh, guidance or, or meeting the high end of guidance. Uh, again, it's our, our smallest mine. It's not a large free cash flow contributor to the business, uh, but really a steady performer. Uh, and, uh, you know, a I'm, I'm mine that does contribute every year. Okay. And one of the final things I wanted to touch on, you talked about a little bit before, but obviously we have the Diamba Sud project, which acquired from Chesser Resources and closed on oh, third, almost a half of a year ago. So now as you've been in there, anything else that you can share that you've learned, things that have gone according to what you were expecting or any hurdles that have come up as well as what you see happening going forward there? Well, we produce a comprehensive news release update by the end of the year uh, in December, on including exploration. There we talk about our initial results at the end, if my memory doesn't fail me. Uh, but we continue drilling with all, all, all three rigs. And as I just uh, mentioned, in 2024, it is our largest exploration uh, budget. And it's not only exploration. We, we have a, an $11 million budget for exploration allocated to the Ambassador, plus uh, uh, you know, some two to three million dollars advancing engineering work and environmental work. So we are trying to run parallel with the exploration, which which some 
addressing some uh, uh, critical path issues uh, to shorten uh, the, the the path towards a construction decision. No, for example, if I make a construction decision today and I did nothing on environmental, it will take me probably a year to do environmental monitoring and things before I can apply. Right. Uh, we're we're carrying those things in parallel with the exploration. No, so so when if and when we make the construction decision, uh, we have a lot of that. Uh, work that would be on a critical path taken care of, right? So the, the gross budget, the total figure uh, for the Amba suit in 2024 is $17 million. 11, 11 and a half of that being uh, managed by the exploration group uh, and some 2 to $3 million by the engineering and, and environmental team. Yeah. Damn. Certainly be interesting. Hopefully that goes as well as Seguela did, where obviously nearby in the area and another project that obviously uh, people were perhaps less familiar with when it first started, but we will look forward to seeing how that goes. And the last question I have for you here today, Jorge, interesting one. Ricardo says, I want to in introduce a silver copper project in Chile. How can I connect with Jorge? I'm curious, do you ever hear from shareholders and maybe you or, or have you seen other companies in your experience and time doing this where they get good ideas and if people do have something they think is worthwhile, is there a way that they can get in touch with management and at least suggest that? Hey, listen, a good idea can come from anywhere, right? So yeah, absolutely. We have a info at fortunasilver.com and, and uh, if you write an email to info, uh, at Fortuna, uh, make sure be sure that we we will get it and and uh, uh, we'll look at it and, and and reply to you. Okay, well, I think that's always nice to hear when companies are open to things like that because, like you said, uh, a lot of space on the globe, and you never know where some of those minerals might be sitting. And good to have uh, an open mind there. Jorge, uh, before we wrap up, anything else that we didn't cover today that you'd like to share and let people know about? No, I mean, we, we are feeling very, very good, very strong with the year-end results and looking forward to a strong, a strong 2024. Uh, I mean, we have guided for historic record uh, gold equivalent production. And we have, as I mentioned, two, three, uh, very exciting high value opportunities to continue supporting the portfolio moving forward. And those are at Seguela, uh, at the Ambassad, and, and uh, still remaining exploration potential at uh, Yeramoco and, and San Jose. So that's where the money is going. No, we have a sizable exploration budget of close to $38 million in 2024. And, uh, you know, well, the money is being allocated where it needs to be. So, uh, yeah, we're looking to a strong very 2024. Very pleased with uh, how I see the company today. Yeah. Yeah. And just speaking to what you said about money going to what it's allocated towards, I would suggest even on days where the stock price is down, something to look back to in a recent history is the process when things started with the Rocks Gold takeover and everything that's going on in Seguela. And I think that's really quite an accomplishment, something that I'm sure you're quite proud of how... I'll, I'll tell you something, Chris. In 20, 2007, Fortuna produced 50,000 ounces of gold equivalents, 50 yeah. to 60,000 ounces of gold equivalents. You know, takes time, but uh, years have passed. And today, uh, you know, we are 5,500 people making Fortuna happen every day, top quality people, you know. We have a, a diverse uh, team of engineers, executives, uh, operating over in, in, in seven countries, if I consider our home base at, in Canada, operating in seven countries, 5,500 people. And we're guiding to almost half a million ounces of, of, of gold equivalent production in 2024. We have a sound balance sheet. We're not a highly debt leveraged company. 
And uh, no, I think we're in a very strong position. You know, if market is today is seeing a distortion because you have uh, quantum traders and uh, hedge funds and algorithm trading and, and panicky retail investors or, or, or traders, you know, what can I say? No, uh, I focus on, on, I have to focus on the long term and I do pay attention to the short term, of course, but uh, uh, if, if we're well anchored on long term, you know, I'm, I'm okay and stay the course. Yeah. Well, I think that's certainly something that people are looking for, especially as I imagine I think there's a good chance it would be this year, but in the coming years, we'll see perhaps more mainstream participation into gold and silver. And it's been really nice to see in the past couple of years as you guys have expanded a lot of your media efforts. I, I think people are getting a real good idea of what you stand for, of a company that's well run, has good assets. The market's going to go up and down on different days, but Jess has been a pleasure speaking to you regularly and seeing how you guys follow through on things. And as we wrap up, I'll just mention that people can find out more at FortunaSilver.com. And if they do have questions, uh, Jorge, you mentioned you have some great people on your team. One of my favorites being Carlos Baca, who is in the investor relations. And you can go up there and click contact, email and info at Fortuna Silver and talk with Carlos. I'm sure he can pass along a message to Jorge and that is where you can find out more. But Jorge, appreciate you making some time and congratulations on the record production. And again, just keeping a steady hand as you lead things going forward. And we'll look forward to checking in with you again soon, but always a pleasure to catch up with you. Thank you for the opportunity, Chris. All the best. Oh,